Uh, welcome, friends, Romans, and countrymen. Um, it's been a fun semester already, but you know what? It's already time for the first midterm next Tuesday. Um, boy, it's gone fast. And you know, it's going to be right now, everybody's out there freezing and wearing winter coats and stuff. But you know, before long, it's going to be hot and sweaty when you get out of class. It just, it's always like that. Life is fragile, and it's very quick. Uh, SI schedule. So today's Thursday. Did you have some people this morning? Good. All right. And, oh, I forgot to mention it uh, verbally. Um, and I'll, I can't put it in, but I'll, I'll make a note that uh, Yasmin has a special SI review Monday. Monday, 3.30, um, BA1, uh, 2.18. And it will be a s special session uh, to get you uh, ready for the exam number one uh, on Tuesday. So hopefully that will be helpful. Also, I have office hours at 10 to 11 Monday morning. So you can go to my office hours and then go to uh, Yaz's um, SI review, and uh, and that'll be good. And eventually we'll be getting an office hour or so uh, with Anna, uh, but she's we still haven't got that organized yet. But hopefully for exam two that'll be going. Um, let me think. What else was I going to say? Is that enough? Yes, for your announcement. Okay. All right, um, let's go over a few things. I know that, you know, you've never had an exam from me and you're going to be nervous. It's normal. Uh, hopefully you don't get too nervous, uh, but just nervous enough to study hard. And that's what we want. Uh, so it's going to be the full class period. So now we won't start exactly at 1.30, probably like 1.35. You'll have the test and I'll, I'll turn you loose. But you'll have pretty much the full um, 75 minutes, most of it. So you might have 70 minutes. Uh, and get here fast. Uh, be here on time. Uh, because um, the rule is if you get here after the first person finishes, you are not allowed to take the test. All right? So you got to be here. Now, usually on a test of this size, Somebody finishes in about 20 minutes. And it's no, like Chanel, it's, it doesn't mean that the person is smart. It just means that they, they work fast and they, they might have a good grade. They might not. You know, they're just kind of cruising through there. And uh, hopefully, not they're, hopefully they're not doing a Christmas tree on the Scantron or whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, so get, get here on time and get ready. Um, and I think what we'll do uh, preliminarily is we'll have seating probably in the first eight rows. Okay, and we'll just cram everybody in. All right, so you'd be sitting sitting next to somebody, uh, and so uh, and that'll make it easier for us to hand out the exams if we get everybody crammed in into a small area, all right? Uh, for, it'll, so 50 points, about 40 uh, Scantron questions, one point each, and there'll be a few eye clicker questions, and they might be two or three points, and those will be like maybe calculations, or maybe I'll ask you a, a question and you have to type in a word that you think is good, and then I'll grade each word, each answer that you send. I'll look at it and decide if it's a good answer or not. Uh, so it's possible in iClicker questions to get partial credit, unlike a Scantron question, which either you have or you don't. Uh, the clicker items will be self-paced. So they'll be on a on, – usually I make them on a separate page. At the top of the page are the instructions for how to do the self-paced mode with your iClicker. 
and it's not that hard. Um, and, but and you just but you'll be doing the questions at your pace, so you can do them first, or you can save them for the end, or save them for the middle, or any other time. There's so versus like here in class, you have to do it when I set the the you know when I uh, activate the question, and then when I finish it, you have to be finished. Uh, but on the exam, it'll be self-paced. Uh, Chris, Daniel, David, Samuel, George, Brad. Okay, Brad. I'll show you in a minute the raspberry flavor, the raspberry colored one. Okay. All right. Now, the first few questions, as we already talked about in lecture four, will be formula matching. So don't worry about, you know, go ahead and study the form, you know, make a list for yourself. But don't feel like you have to memorize it. What you really want to do is be able to recognize it. See it because you're going to have a, a formula on one side of the page and then like a concept or a definition that you match to it. And so you get a point if you can recognize it. So, uh, but don't ask, don't actually uh, worry about, um, uh, you know, memorizing. You know, that's not going to help you a whole lot. Okay, exam procedures. Uh, first of all, be on time. Be ready to sit in a slightly different order, as I mentioned. Okay, so you, you were, I think we're going to squeeze. You know, we have an exact uh, diagram, thanks to Anna, our TA. She mapped out the entire room. So uh, the other thing that we might do, if I feel like it, is spread out everybody in the entire room with one seat between you and your neighbor. Some, so, but we, I don't know if we have quite enough seats for that, but I'll check it out. Anyways, be ready for something, and it'll be on the screen when you come in. I'll have, you know, everybody sit in the first eight rows or everybody sit, you know, one seat between you and your neighbor and whatnot. I'll have that all figured out for you. It'll be something slightly different than where you, where you are now. Uh, and here's the rule. After the first student hands in the test, uh, nobody who is tardy may take the exam. Um, for a few students, you'll be over at SAS. I'll just report over there at the beginning of class. Uh, you'll use a Scantron as usual. And then the clicking items, you'll just write them in. And I'll grade them the old-fashioned way with a red ink pen. Okay, so that'll be squared. So don't worry about your clicker if you're over at SAS. Everything goes good. And we'll pick up everything when you're done. Uh, again, there's no cell, no cell phone use for any reason. And if we see you using a cell phone, we'll assume you're cheating, okay? Um, uh, so don't don't even break it out. Okay, I see everybody, you know, in class, it's one thing, but not on the exam. You may not have it. You may not have it out. Just put it in your bag or your back pocket or wherever you keep it, and uh, don't even take it out. Uh, bring your own calculator. You can't use your cell phone calculator. So here's what to bring. iClicker, Scantron. Pencil and eraser, of course, and your calculator. All right, now here's here's the one that I have. That's um, it's in my knapsack, but it looks like that. Uh, and I think that one costs like 15 bucks at Walmart. So so trot over to the bookstore. They might have you know they might have a good deal on a calculator. Question. The question is, do you have to put your ID number on the Scantron? And the answer to that is yes. You have to put your PID. Now, that's the number on your ID card, your UCF ID number. It used to be a letter followed by a bunch of numbers, but now apparently all you have to do on the Scantron will still allow you to type in a letter or dot in a letter, but it's only looking at the number part. So, okay, so question. Uh, wait a minute. Caitlin, yes. <laughs> the Caitlin Meister. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you can use any kind of, as long as you have a square root, you're probably okay. And if you don't bring one, you'll be able to survive without a 
you know, calculator. You just have to do stuff out on scratch paper like you did in fifth grade. You know, so you'll be all right. Don't worry about that. Eye clicker, definitely bring that. A good pencil. And hey, you guys, I uh, like this these these little you know second grade. Er I got one in here somewhere. Oh uh, yeah, here it is. I like these you know these little you know ones pink ones from sep second grade uh, because. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you get a cheap pencil like this one. This is brand X. Uh, and it writes okay, but the eraser just tears apart your Scantron. So it's it's pretty bogus. Now, here's the Scantron you want, Brad. This is the raspberry colored one. It has the UCF logo on it. Uh, and I think, actually, this is an older picture. I think it has more than just that on it now. Uh, but that's the one that you'll want. Now, you'll be filling up 40-something uh, dots on the front of that. And then we'll do a few clicker questions. And uh, so the just so you know, uh, a number of years ago, my supervisor, who's no longer here, my department chairman, w was asking me, well, how big are you making your exams? And I said, well, I usually have about 50 questions. And he told me... Um, my rule of thumb is on a multiple choice Scantron exam, one question for every minute, right? And so in a 50 minute exam period, that would mean 50 questions if it was all Scantron. And so what you guys will get, so you're gonna have a little bit of extra time because we have like, we're gonna have like maybe 65, 70 minutes and only, uh, 40 something uh, Scantron questions because you're going to have a couple, you know, maybe one or two, three eye clicker questions, and those will take a little more time. Okay. So you should be good. It works out pretty good, and most people will have plenty of time. You know, and there's always a few people that work all the way up to the buzzer at the end of the hour, 245. And, you know, we have to bail out of here fast because there's a big herd of. Uh, psychology students coming in for psychology statistics right after this. And you do not want to be in the path of that thundering herd of, uh, and I'm sure that there's some psych majors in here. So you know what that class is like. Anyways, uh, be ready to bolt out of here. So if you work up to the buzzer, you know, th that's good. But most people will be done well before that. So what you'll do is you'll come up here to the front, you'll drop off your Scantron and the exam form, with both with your name and PID on it, and then you'll blaze out of here either by that exit or by that one over there. All right, so you just kind of circulate through here and, and drop it off, and then you're, you can be on your way, all right? And uh, we're... We're kind of at the tail end of flu season, but this thing from China, nobody knows what that's going to be like. I highly recommend that you bring uh, for your own use, and I have a bunch. I have some for my use in the TA, uh, just some uh, hand desanitizer, a uh, tiny container like this ought to do fine just to desanitize your hands after the exam because, you know, a lot of times you're coughing all over it and if you're, you know, and then you're dropping it up here on, in a pa pile of papers and everybody's been – I hate to say – I love teaching and I, I love students, but on exams I've noticed some really disgusting behavior – from students you know one time i had a scantron and uh it came back from the test scoring service with a little sticky note on it could not grade wet yuck so whoever's test that was i had to grade it by hand and it was and it was still wet like after two days it was oh ooh, yuck <laughs> 
Anyway, so students have this disgusting behavior, so that's why you always want to have some of this stuff on exams stuff. At least my student, my TAs and I, uh, we always try to do that. All right, so, so that's the stuff you want to bring. Now, as far as strategy, study strategy, uh, study with at least one other person. That really makes a difference. Just talk things over, kind of like what we do in lecture. All right, I, I encourage you to do that when you're doing clicker questions. You guys are starting to do that. That's great. Okay, if you have a friend in this class or if a friend that's had this class that you can study with or if you can go to SI and make friends with somebody and maybe a new study partner, you know, it makes a big difference, uh, I guarantee you. Um, and when you get to the test itself, I cannot overemphasize that you, just like Arnold says, read the question very carefully. All right? Do not go too fast. And, you know, I see sometimes I have to grade a student, um, you know, where their, their Scantron gets all uh, corrupted up, maybe not wet. But, you know, for some reason, they don't have a Scantron. So I have to go through the, the, you know, and grade it by hand, you know, page by page, which is not hard, but it's hard if you have to do 190 of them. But one of them is not hard to do. And, you know, I, I'll tell you what, every time I do that, I'll, you know, because I, I, I circle the correct answer if they get it wrong. And a lot of times you can see the student, they're doing it in pencil, and they're circling their answers as they go. And a lot of times on a wrong, a wrong answer, they will have circled the wrong answer, okay, and they get it wrong. But if I look carefully, I'll see that they earlier circled the right answer and erased it. So do not – they say that your, fir, the, your first instinct is usually correct, all right? So don't go back. Now, if you have some, you know, blinding insight, you know, 20 minutes later and, oh, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do, then maybe you can go. But if you're, if, you're, if you're shaky, if you don't know, you know, try to make an educated guess. Eliminate some of the alternative answers. There's going to be one good one. There's going to be some tempting ones. Um, but there's going to be at least three false answers and one good one. All right? So try to eliminate some if you can. There's still space up here in front. And, uh, uh, but don't, you know, don't second guess yourself. Now, you're going to be really nervous on exam day. Nothing to do about that. It's just the, the nature of, the, of school. It's the nature of things. Uh, but you'll get used to my exam uh, technology, my exam thinking and stuff. So by the second or third exam, you'll really start to, have more confidence than you may on exam one. Some of you will start crushing exam one immediately, but others it might take a little bit longer time. All right. Now, let us uh, let me pause for questions. Okay, let's continue. Now, let me draw your attention to this big outline that we had uh, last time. We were talking about the two skateboarders. And this is the data from the textbook as well. It's in uh, the beginning of Chapter 4.1. So we're actually going to uh, do a little bit of skipping forward to 4.1 before we quite finish Chapter 3. And this is the part from Chapter 4.1 that we're going to talk about a little bit today. And we talked about a little bit last time. And I pointed out to you that, you know, all these calculations we did, uh, the curious thing that is that, um, you know, the two things that we know are equal, the interaction force equal but opposite according to Sir Isaac Newton, you know, one of them's positive 500 to the right, one of them's negative 500 newtons to the left, um, and the interaction time, of course, is the same 0 0.48 or whatever the interaction time is. Uh, but hardly anything else is equal in there. I mean, you look at it and, uh, you know, like, you know, Bob's 
uh, Delta V and Carl's Delta V, those are, you know, they're, they're way different. Their final velocities, way different. You know, their accelerations, way different. So, you know, Sir Isaac Newton is, you know, in his third law, you know, he uses this idea of equal but opposite reaction. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's not equal. And so you have to ask yourself, well, okay, he does, you know, equal but opposite forces, okay. But uh, what is, is there anything else that's equal? Surely something else must be equal. And we're going to get into that um, uh, this hour during this lecture. Now, I want you to get your clicker out. Uh, we're going to do some multiple choice uh, items. And um, let me do this first one. What is the product of interaction force 500 newtons and elapsed time 0 0.48 seconds? Go ahead and Turn on your clicker. We're on frequency BC. Get a go nitro and let's go. Uh, so I secretly know the answer to this. And as, as I just said a few minutes ago, read very carefully and think. Don't just. I see some people up here in the, in the second row. They're, they got clicker in one hand and calculator in the other. Lovely. Do not forget your calculator on Tuesday. Thirty seconds. Fifty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One, zero. Okay, 120 people answered. Boy, there's a lot of absent. A lot of people. See, that's what I don't like that, especially the day before an exam. But you know, I can't make you guys come to class. Um, yeah, the answer is 240 newton seconds. It's just you know 500 times 0 0.48, and the unit of measurement is called a newton second. All right. N S. Um, so let me rotate my chair here a little bit. So um, right here, what? Uh, so uh, one point zero newton seconds is the same as. All right, here's a newton, kilogram meter per second squared, as we talked about last time. And uh, here's one point oh second. Now this second over here cancels one from the bottom. So in reality, it's the same as kilogram meters per second. All right. Now, make sure you write that down. One newton second is the same as one kilogram meter per second. All right. And that is important because this stuff over here is a mass times a speed or mass times a velocity. All right. And that quantity, uh, m delta v, well, let's, uh, let's continue to think about that. Hold on just a second here. All right. So let's go to the next question. All right. And for those of you that are trying to catch the notes here, don't forget this is on YouTube a little bit later this afternoon. Here's question number two. If f is equal to m, uh, delta V over delta T, 
then F delta T would be equal to what? All right, so here's your, you know, so here's Newton's second law right here that we've been talking about. All right, now, if that's true, then what would this be over here on the right side on this second equation block? Go ahead and make a vote and think. Think, think, think. And for some of you that are up on your algebra, you can see it right away. I can see people pointing at it and stuff and going like this. Good. Talk with your neighbor. Talk it over. This is an important thing to be able to recognize. All right. Now, get my cursor back over here. Oh. My goodness. Oh, my gaseous. All right, 15 seconds of vote, starting right now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, zero. Bing. Um, yeah, you guys are geniuses, pretty much. Um, yeah, so all you got to do here is cross multiply, really. Cross multiply delta T over to the left side, and you have F delta T on the left, and then you have M delta V uh, on the right. And uh, my wonderful students, that means that this equation um, is true. It is a form of Newton's second law, but we call it the impulse equation. A force times a time interval will give you a change in your m delta v or a change in your mv, all right? And so this is the stuff in chapter 4.1 that is equal. If you go back to the data for Bob and Carl and you multiply M and V, you'll see at the end of the interaction, after the interaction, M times delta B for both of those guys equals the same, except one of them's negative and one of them's positive. But in terms of their sizes, they're the same, all right? And that's because they each have the same interaction force on the left, and they each have the same interaction time, delta T, also on the left. So whatever M and, and delta V are, they have to multiply out the same for Bob as for Carl, for Joyce as for Caitlin. And... That, my wonderful students, is the picture of interaction that rules the cosmos. You know, Caitlin and Joyce, they were up here. They did a great job. But they didn't know that they were modeling every known physical interaction, whether it's nuclear, electric, electromagnetic, or gravitational. They can all be thought of an exchange of impulse, F delta T. You know, the force of gravity. You know, between the Earth and the moon, yeah. You know, moon's much bigger. So, the, the or excuse me, the Earth is much bigger, so it doesn't really have much uh, delta V, just like the bigger person on the skateboard example, Bob or Carl, I can't remember which, had a smaller delta V, had more mass, smaller delta V. Same thing with the Earth and the moon. The Earth is way uh, more kilograms than the moon. And so we see the moon uh, orbiting, changing its, its velocity and so on. Uh, but actuality, the, the Earth is actually doing a little bit of a dance of its own, but it's harder to see because it's so small. Uh, so impulse gives us, is another way of giving us a, a way, a, an easier way to calculate a stopping time. Now, we're going to go into that uh, after exam two a little bit.
because um, we have other fish to fry here today. But here's a picture of a um, a German postage stamp for, I don't know, 100. It can't be 100 euros, so it has to be 100, fennig, 100 pennies. I don't even know if they had. Has anybody been over to Germany and you know what the, the currency is like over there? It's, so it's euros, and what are the coins? Pennies, pfennig, yeah. So this would probably be a 100-penny postage stamp. And look what he's got up here. Da, da, da. That's what Sir Isaac did. You know, if you, if you read his book, the, Prince, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, the first page is set up with these concepts in mind. If you know that, you can see them in the, like the first two or three paragraphs. It's all there. He said, and you know what he's setting it up to do is to understand the orbit of the moon and the earth, or the orbit of the moon around the earth and tie it to uh, um, terrestrial gravity, you know, the apple falling out of the tree. So uh, impulse. Now, we're going to keep talking about that after exam two. Before we do that, though, I want to do a little practice. Here's another clicker question. You observe a large 4.5 kilogram blob of green jello floating in space. And the Klingon bird of prey vessel applies a tractor beam. All right. How large is the acceleration? All right now, this is not an impulse calculation. It's an acceleration calculation. But we're going to relate it to impulse. And let me start the question. Okay. And just click in A, B, C, or D. But think carefully about. And, you know, here's another thing. On a multiple choice, I can make a tempting answer that's incorrect if I make it a correct answer for a different question that may come to your mind when you read it. You know, so I'm asking about acceleration. If I put in there the impulse value, you might think, oh, impulse, bing. But I'm not asking about impulse. I'm asking about acceleration. So that's why I always say, you know, read carefully. Or as Arnold says, listen to me very carefully. And definitely talk to your neighbor and double check to see what their calculation is. And, you know, and you know you can't do it on an exam, but definitely, yeah, you can do it on uh, in class on lecture day. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, there's people up here talking to Anna and, and Yaz and getting a lot of a little bit of extra coaching right in class. Nice. But you know, if there's somebody that's a friend of yours in class or a roommate or whatnot, yeah, why don't you just sit with them in class and study? Study together a little bit. It definitely helps. And I'll go through the calculation with you after I turn off the question. 30 seconds.
Yes. You guys done? All right, I'll give you a little more time. You know what? I should have put one more clicker question in today. Look, there's there's different ways to do stuff, so you know, so you guys you guys clicked in over here? You clicked? All right, ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one, zero. All right. Click. Um, let's take a look at this. Um, C is the correct answer, and there's a little bit of a spread. Of some of you voted for D, B, and A. So let's take a look at those other. Uh, questions now D 9.0 kilogram meters per second is you know what that is that's the initial value of MV 4.5 kilograms times 2.0 meters per second and uh, but that's not an acceleration all right that's an impulse or a momentum as we call it uh, C is correct uh, 88 meters per second squared. Uh, actually, I think that's a reference to uh, Back to the Future. Um, sometimes I run out of tempting answers, so I just put in like 42 or 88 or something. 16.5. Oh, that's 12 plus 4.5. You know, I have to I have to figure out answers that maybe look plausible but aren't and i definitely you know d is definitely a tempting one and let's just take a look at how you guys yeah d was the second biggest pile of answers so so remember that you know so here's the correct answer and here's the calculation uh the net force divided by the mass that's the acceleration that's newton's second law in terms of the acceleration a equals F over M. So it's um, 12 Newtons uh, divided by uh, 4.5 kilograms. All right. Now, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So if you have a Newton divided by a kilogram, you cancel kilograms top and bottom. And you're left with meter per second squared. In this case, 2.67. All right. Questions about this calculation? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, let me get my clicker. All right, how much speed toward the Klingons does the Jello acquire? All right. So the tractor beam is trying to, you know, they're trying to get that jello. It's Klingons. The this is a snapshot of wartime action between the Klingon and the the jello. I mean, come on. Two seconds of tractor beam. How much does the speed change? Or how much velocity does it acquire toward the Klingon bird of prey? Which you have to admit is one of the coolest starships in the galaxy. Way better than a Death Star.
Lu, lu, lu. La, la, la. La, la, di. Nu, nu, nu. Okay, uh, 45 seconds, starting right now. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ding. Oh my goodness. We get a little bit of we get a little bit of an argument, but a good number of you have got it right. So let's bring this back over here and take a look. Uh, the correct answer is A. Uh, is that what I had here? Yeah. Okay. Um and here's the calculation. Delta V, you just calculated the acceleration. So the change in the speed toward the Klingon bird of prey vessel is simply the acceleration times how long the tractor beam's working. All right, so that's two seconds. So 2.67 meters per second squared of acceleration from the tractor beam. Um, now, if you had a smaller blob of, you know, like a mini blob of jello, only like two kilograms, can you imagine how big a two kilogram unit of jello would be? 4.5 kilograms would be as big as this desk. That's a lot of jello. But, anyways, a different sized blob of jello would be attracted a lot more quickly because it has smaller mass. You know, 12 Newton tractor beam. This one, 2.67. And two seconds worth, so so you're talking 5.3 or 5.333 repeating. All right. Now I'm going to make some notes about this, and so go. We're done with the questions for for the moment. Um, in two seconds, the impulse m delta v, which we just figured out is 24 newton seconds and that's the same as 24 kilogram meters per second now how do you get that it's just this 4.5 times 5.33 and that works out to 24 kilogram meters per second and you know what else you can get it from this the size of the tractor beam 12 newtons times 2 also 24 kilogram meters per second All right. Now I'm going to go and we're going to do a little out, a little mini outline here about the impulse law. Okay, F delta T equals delta P. That quantity mv on the right that's being delta is known as the momentum, and its usual symbol is P. And you can oops, you can read about it in um, chapter four. Um, this um, law, uh, in, in, uh, it, it, uh, it allows you to 
uh, apply the third law very carefully. And at the same time, it uses the concept of momentum, as I just mentioned. That's the MV quantity. Um, and this is a side note for the future. Uh, in, in Chapter 4, we're going to talk about collisions. And you know what, uh, Caitlin and Joyce? Collisions are interactions. Okay? And we don't think of you two guys, you know, up there on skateboards as being a collision, but you can still think of a collision as an exchange of momentum, an exchange of impulse, which is what you guys did. Um, and so when we get into Chapter 4 after Exam 2, we're going to be talking about a momentum and how it's a conserved quantity. Because F delta T is identical, according to Newton's third law. And so for each interacting object, delta MV, the change in the momentum, the change in the impulse, is the same for each object. So that's, that's why momentum is going to be conserved. Now, we're not going to work out those collision problems till after exam one, okay? But that's on the, on the uh, horizon for us. Okay, now let me pause for questions. Yes. It is. It's a way, and sometimes it's a little more convenient to think of it in terms of MV and, and F delta T. But sometimes, you know, F equals MA is, is the way, to, you know, the way to do it. Question. P stands for momentum. That's the usual. I don't know why they call it P, but it's a customary symbol the wide world over. So we're, we're not really stuck with it, but we're, we're kind of stuck. We're semi-stuck with it. I've never seen anybody write it differently, but you can call it. You can call it Bob if you want, or use, you know, some Egyptian hieroglyphic if you want. But for some reason, we use the symbol P. Now, I want to talk about uniform circular motion, uh, which is now um, the uh, 3.6 in our, our uh, free textbook. And uh, we're going to finish with this and maybe talk a little bit about universal gravitation if we have time. Now, the Nardo ring is a test track. Here's an overhead view of it. In the southern part of Italy, in the boot heel of Italy. So here's where it is, Nardo, Italy, uh, down there. And, you know, the Fiat company back, you know, many years ago, they built this big uh, circular test track. Here's a little close-up. Uh, and it's right across from Albania. And here's what it looks like from space. There's, uh, there it is. And here's a little bit closer view. And uh, so the radius is about 2,000 meters. It's a two kilometer radius, so total diameter four kilometers. You can see it from space. So here's the satellite directly overhead. All right. And it's a test track, and automakers from all over Europe use it um, for uh, endurance testing and uh, high-speed endurance testing of their vehicles. The outermost lane, uh, it's banked. The Nardo ring is banked, you know, like the Daytona racetrack. And it's all turn. It's, it's one big, long turn. It just never stops. It's a perfect circle. And it's banked all the way. And it's banked so that the outermost lane uh, is perfect for driving at about 149 miles an hour. Okay, so up there in Europe, they have these things called the Autobahn. And there's stretches of the Autobahn where there's no speed limit, which is what it used to be like out in Montana back in the day. And, uh, and when I lived out there, you could drive, during the day, you could drive any speed that you thought was prudent. And so, for instance, on a, you know, on a foggy day or a rainy day, you weren't going to drive 100. But if it was a clear, nice day, which you have tons of out in Montana, 
uh, you could drive 100. You know, because it's so towns are so far apart out there that you know you just got to blaze. And watch out. Well, if you're up in the mountains, you can't do it. And up in the mountains where the elk live, uh, you don't have the long straight roads, so you can't get that. You better not try driving 100. If you drive, if you want to drive faster than 149, you got to put a little bit of a crank on the steering wheel. But if you're at 149, it's almost like driving straight, except you're tilted sideways. You got a little bit of sideways tilt. And I believe they go around counterclockwise on the Nardo ring, so it's a left turn. Now, the innermost lane is for testing trucks, and it's banked for an optimal speed uh, of uh, 50 miles an hour. So uh, so this one, again, if you, if you go faster than 50, you have to crank the steering wheel if you're in that lane. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do next uh, is derive some equations for the acceleration around that circle. Because we're changing, you know, if you're, at a, if you're on cruise control at 149 miles per hour, your velocity vector is still changing because it's changing direction. And that counts as an acceleration. Anytime that velocity arrow changes, either its length by getting bigger, faster, or smaller, slower, or changes direction left and right, that's an acceleration. You, you need some kind of a force to do that. You need some F equals MA. Now, what we're going to do is derive a couple equations on a, a simple circular path and for an object that's at constant speed, so like something on the Nardo ring with cruise control, all right? So the same speed on the speedometer, but you're, you're going around the circle. So you don't have to, you can just, you know, you get up to speed, make sure your, your wheels are straight, and just sit back and enjoy it, all right? And you just, you know, until the gas runs out, all right? So let's talk about uniform circular motion, all right? Now, we're on a circle, constant speed. And what I'm going to do is sketch out, and I hope you'll do the same, sketch out uh, two circles, two instants of time on this circle. Now, here's instant of time T1, all right? So the, the line segment marked R is the radius and it's going out to the 3 o'clock position, all right? And at that position, we're going counterclockwise, so the velocity vector, V, is straight up, all right? Because the velocity vector is always tangent to whatever path you're on, whatever the curve is, all right? Now, a little bit later, time T2, Let's say you've gone around about 30 degrees, so now you're at about 2 o'clock, right? So this is a, a little bit of time later. You know, so we got a little bit of a delta T here, all right? And now your, um, your position radius is at the 2 o'clock position, and now your velocity, instead of pointing straight up at 12 o'clock noon, it's pointing uh, a little bit to the left um, at about 11 o'clock, right, 11 a.m. All right, so here's what that, all right, so there's my, now, if it's uniform circular motion, that means the speed is not changing. We're on cruise control, and so the length of those two arrows is exactly the same. Now, the thing about it is, if you're in class, you want to make sure you stay awake, okay? And if you have uniform circular motion, you want the two arrows to be the same size. Now, they're not going to be the same direction at every instant of time. You're on a track. You know, you're moving. But the length, the speedometer reading, is going to be constant, all right? So, and, and they, the distance away from the center... So put a dot in the center as well. 
All right. Now, what I'm going to do is use the fact that we're on a circle to relate these two pictures. All right. These are two snapshots in time at T1 and T2. And the fact is that the radii, they're the same length, and they both touch the center of the circle, all right? So it's possible to take one, take a copy, and kind of move it over here, and, yeah, that's a fair representation, all right? So that the they both touch at the center. Now, I'm going to park that over here to the side, all right? So go ahead and make a copy of your two radii and try to make them about 30. That's 30 degrees apart. You know, I did this really carefully at 30 degrees, okay? You can do it on a, calc on a computer pretty carefully. Now, we're going to do the same thing over here with the velocity vectors, okay? So we're going to take the velocity vectors. So there's my copy. All right, my my initial one straight up, and then my set my later one at 11 o'clock. And let me just mo move mine. See, there's the copy, and I'm just going to move mine over here to the upper right. You know, so out of the way, so we can make a a diagram and and make some deductions. Now, let me move my initial two diagrams off to the side. All right, so they're still up there in miniaturized form. And now I have down here in the lower left, I have the black segments. And they form a V kind of sideways in this view. And then over here, the red arrows for the velocity, and they form a V. And hey, you guys, are those two Vs the same tilt angle apart? They, they should be. You know, because you... See, the, the, no matter where you are on the circle, the radius and the velocity are perpendicular, all right? So if one changes by 30, the other changes by 30, all right? Now, draw in a line segment to connect the two radii, and go ahead and mark in R and R, all right? So... Um, now, what kind of a triangle do you call that? Remember the fancy name for that from geometry class? Isosceles. It's an isosceles. All right. And what would you call the dotted line? That's the base of an isosceles. But physically, in terms of positions, what would you call that dotted line? No, it's, it's not a hypotenuse. Well, it could be a hypotenuse of something. But physically, you know, your car is at the nine o'clock, is at the three o'clock position, then it's at the two position. So what's changed? They've changed position. Right? So this is the that line segment is approximately the distance. Now, why do I have the word approximate here? Why isn't it exact distance? Why can't I use exact distance between the two positions? Why? The circle is curved. So this is this is a straight line, and the circle is just a little curve, a little bit more, a little bit longer because it's going along a curve. So we just use the word approximate. Now, over here, I have vectors V1 and V2. All right. And those have the same length. And so now, go ahead and draw the base of that isosceles triangle in red, a red dotted line up there. Now, what would you call that part of the isosceles triangle, of the red velocity triangle. What would you call that? It's not a change of position. What is it? No, it's not a 
it does have a change. It does it have a change of direction to it, but it's something more than that. It's a delta v. Okay, so there's your delta v vector. All right, so we have approximate distance, and we have a delta v vector. All right. And so delta V is V2 minus V1. You know that. Now, here's the, here's the important point that I want to uh, emphasize with you. And that is these two triangles, uh, they're similar. They're proportional triangles. So the angles are equal. Okay. So the base angles are 75. And 75, and then the, the, the sharp one is 30. And that's because the angles inside of a triangle have to add up to 180. All right, so you can always, if you know one of the, if you know the sharp angle, you can always figure out the other two. And you're going to see that on homework. And so what we're going to do is relate um, the distance here, which is approximately V delta T, and that's the key to our understanding here, really. We're going to relate that to the Vs, the Rs, and the delta V. All right? That, um, that short side of the position triangle is a key. Now, they're both uh, proportional triangles. Okay, so go ahead and label this. Um, this side over here, go ahead and label that V delta T. And we know that it's approximately V delta T. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. And now he, up here, on top here, that's a proportion. Now let's look at that as a proportion. R and V are the two long sides. So for the position triangle, the long side is R. For the velocity triangle, the long side is V. Okay, now, so the position triangle is on top of the proportion, and the velocity triangle information is in the bottom part of the proportion. Okay, so this is how proportional triangles work. So this is um, long side to long side. Now, that's equal to uh, this, this uh, ratio, and that is base to base. Okay, so V delta T is the base of the position triangle. Right, that's this this guy down here. And then this one over here, the denominator on the right, that's just the uh, delta V, that's the base of my velocity triangle. So there's no there's no top secret strategy here. We're just doing we're just doing proportions. And you can't say that they're equal. You can't say that these two triangles are equal. Because one is measured in meters, the position triangle, and the other one, the lengths are measured in uh, meters per second because it's a velocity triangle. But you can still say that they're proportional, and that's what we have here. All right? Now, the key proportion that locks in the formulas. We're getting a formula for the acceleration. So there's an isosceles side, position dot speed, position over speed. And then over here, that's the isosceles base, position dot speed. So the position triangle base divided by the speed triangle base. All right. Now, let me ask you a question. I want you to look at that proportion. You know, I got all little circles around it and annotations and whatnot. So look at that proportion. R over V equals V delta T over delta V. Does anybody see an acceleration in there? Look. Look at it and think. Do you see, a, do you see an acceleration in there? What's the definition of acceleration anyways? A equals Tom, uh, Antonio? A equals 
Delta V divided by delta. You see any delta V's divided by delta T's up there? What do you see? What do you see? Yeah, it's right here. Look, it's right here. It's delta V. It's flipped. It's flip flopped. So you have an acceleration here in the denominator. Delta V over delta T in the denominator is going to look like this. Delta V in the denominator, delta T in the upstairs. All right, so there's a secret acceleration. So let's get delta V by itself. Now, delta V and delta T, I should say, are by themselves. Now you're going to do a bunch of cross multiplication. So here we go. All right, there's the result. If you cross multiply delta V, cross multiply delta T, and cross multiply R and V from the left over to the right, on the right you get V squared over R. And on the left, you get good old delta V over delta T. That's kind of what we were looking for. All right. Now, there's nothing fancy about this. It's just the fact that we have uniform circular motion. All right. And so this, my wonderful students, is what we call the acceleration that keeps an object on a circular path. It is called the centripetal acceleration. C-E-N-T-R-I-P-E-T-A-L. Now, do not confuse it with centrifugal acceleration, centrifugal. You'll hear a lot of people use that term, and they're not supposed to use that interchangeably with centripetal. Now, centrifugal is a term that you can use for certain kinds of analyses. But for what we're going to be doing, we only want to think of centripetal. Centrifugal, fugal, F-U-G, that's the, the Latin root word for flee. Fugitive, a fugitive from justice. Flee, flees from justice. Fugue. So this one, and then sentry, meaning center, so this, this is a, a, a centrifugal force or a centrifugal acceleration would be pointing away from the center. This one points toward the center. All right? So we use the word centripetal. And PET stands for something like, it doesn't say towards, but it's like, a, I don't know, walking or something like that. But it means centripetal toward the center. Now, here's a picture. All right. So here's my radius, my positional radius. And my centripetal acceleration in blue uh, is toward the center. Now, you're going to have some homework. over the. You're going to have a good-sized homework over the weekend so you can study for the exam. Okay. Um, and you're going to have a question that uh, are a series of questions that guides you through to the point where this vector has to be pointing um, along the radius, okay? And so the velocity is always perpendicular if it's uniform circular motion, and the centripetal acceleration is always toward the center, okay? Uh, so to get the acceleration here, uh, so, for instance, you have to have some grip force. Your tires, you can't make tires out of Teflon and on a track made of Teflon. It won't work. You've got to have some grip. And the track provides that from the third law analysis. All right? Now, you, what you control is the speed, V squared, using the gas and the brakes. All right? So if you have a lot of speed... You're going to have a lot of need. You're going to need a lot of acceleration from your tires. And if you've ever heard somebody go around a corner too fast, you hear you know their tires scream a little bit. You know, and that's because the tires are losing grip. They can't provide the amount of acceleration you need. Right now, if you have good tires, you just go around it like like nobody's business. Now, if 
if you're if you're thinking about R now, that's the design of the track. So if you make R really big, you have a nice easy turn, the radius of curvature of the path. Okay. Uh, and that you know that's you know a granny could drive that. You know at a given speed at any speed you know. And you know up at Daytona they have two two or three turns I think. And one of them, I think, is a pretty big radius turn. And the other two at each end of the track are a little bit smaller, and they, they actually change directions. Uh, so that's in the, in the design of the track. So, so let's make a summary here. Uh, centripetal acceleration, centripetal force. The, because we have proportional triangles for uniform circular motion, the speed triangle is, is proportional to the position triangle. We have this formula, centripetal acceleration, delta V over delta T, is equal to V squared over R. And similarly, uh, mass times that, centripetal force, is MV squared over R. Now, we're going to apply this centripetal force and acceleration concept to... Uh, the concept of universal gravitation, which is the remainder of Chapter 3. But we're not going to do that before Exam 1. So this, plus a little bit of 4.1, is as far as we go for, chapter, for this first exam. And a student asked me the other day, Dr. B., do, are you planning to give out a study guide? And the answer to that is no. You're taking notes. There's, you know, think about it. You don't like taking notes, but use those as your study guide. That's why you take notes. You try to remember the stuff that I talk about. But look, also use the YouTubes, you know, to, to take notes in class and then make your notes better. But no, I never give it. Don't ever ask me for a study guide. I never give them. Okay. I will dismiss a few minutes early today. Homework three, it'll be ready by lunchtime or so tomorrow, due on Tuesday, and it will be a nice little study homework for you. Uh, so do that, and then uh, get ready for exam one, and I'll see you next week. Can you bring it up to 100%, please?